especially at a time when I was so isolated. I was in medical isolation. Um, I couldn't go out in public and um, I was stuck in a room. It felt like a kind of conduit to the outside. It felt um, good uh, to, to shift my perspective away from my own circumstances. Suleika, it was, it's awesome to have you on the podcast at the end of the tunnel. Um, I have been a huge fan of your book and your talks, your TED talk. And so I'm really excited to dive into your backstory. Thanks for coming Thanks. on. Thanks for having me on. It's, it's an honor. So I like to start off the conversations going back to childhood and um, my kickoff question is, well, you, first of all, you had a very interesting childhood. You were kind of all over the place between ages two and 12. So when you think back to little Suleika, um, maybe when you were in your, you know, six, seven, eight years old, did you have a favorite toy or activity that you gravitated towards or you were obsessed with? Mm, I love this question. No one has ever asked me this question. So now I have to think. Um, I think that my favorite uh, activity has always been swimming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as a cancer, I'm very much a water baby. Um, but yeah, swimming um, wherever wherever we were living, wherever we were, I would seek out the water, even if that meant just swimming around in the bathtub. But when we were living in Tunisia, where my dad's from, um, after school, I would go snorkeling with my brother and the neighborhood kids. Um, when we were in Switzerland, which is where my mom's from, uh, we lived across from a lake and mm. I would go swimming there. But yeah, swimming. It's what still swimming the thing represent? that grounds me. <laughs> what did it represent to you? As a child, I mean, not, not you looking back now as an adult, but as a child, what did you love about it? I feel like it's one of those rare activities where you can put forth either a lot of exertion or where you can just be and float. Mm. And so I think something about that range of possibility uh, was enticing to me. Um, but I've always felt, um, I think, most comfortable in water. Um, mm. My dad used to call me de poisson, which means the fish in French. Mm. What does Suleika mean in Tunisian? Oh, um, so it's an old Quranic name. Um, but some people say that it means princess. Others say that it means desert princess. I can't believe I'm sharing this with you. Usually <laughs> I swear people to secrecy when I tell them this, uh, but yeah, desert princess. Okay. Desert <laughs> princess who loved to swim. Yes. You also had a, you also, um, you mentioned in your book that you have been journaling ever since you could hold a pen. Mm -hmm. What was that about? Who, what, what drew you to journaling? Um, I still remember the first time I got a journal. I think um, I must have been in, in second or third grade and my family was getting ready to move yet again as we'd done for pretty much my whole life. And we um, boarded a Tunis air flight from New York City en route to Tunisia. And I had this notebook and it was one of those kind of like leather bound little journals and I opened it on the plane um, and I remember feeling a sense of possibility about what lay ahead and I wrote a character sketch of a kind of aspirational little girl that I hoped to become in that next year and it was this moment where you know, I was about to be the new kid in a school where I knew no one in a place where I hadn't lived before. Um, 
And what happened when I put pen to paper is whatever fear or anxiety or shyness that I felt about what lay ahead um, transformed into a sense of possibility. Um, and I think for me, that was my first indication of um, what can happen when we commit to a daily writing practice that's not about performance uh, or expectation where the stakes are very low and you get to play and invent and reinvent yourself endlessly. Mm. I've kept a journal at times throughout my life. And what I found was in my own journaling experience, I would basically tell stories about my day mm. um, in anticipation of maybe one day looking back and reading that entry and not knowing the context of whatever it was that I was saying. And I found that it, it was pretty exhausting for me. And that's why I would stop when I stopped <laughs> it's because there's just so much context, right? And yeah. then some people journal just like little random thoughts and stream of consciousness. And what was your journaling style and how did you mm. settle on that style? My journaling style was no style. Um, <laughs> I also found it very exhausting to recount all the details big or small of my day. And I never found that to be fun. And it felt like a kind of chore. And I very quickly got sick uh, of my own voice and my own life. Um, I think I've, I've really used the journal as a kind of sketchbook. I write mm. lists, uh, lots of lists. I love lists of do's and don'ts and dreams. Sometimes um, I'll write you know, a list of five scenes from the last 24 hours or last week. So in that sense, maybe I'll record moments, but um, I also write ideas. I write fragments of thoughts. I write poetry. I write the beginning of things like short stories. I wrote a lot of my book in my journal. Um, and, and part of that, I think, is that, you know, especially in a, in a culture where we're so fixated on productivity, on output, um, I've found the computer to be a really stifling creative place. I open up a Word doc and I freeze and I think of all the other things on my computer that I haven't done and the emails I haven't responded to and the bills I need to pay or whatever it might be. But, but the journal, it's, you know, it's a thing that you do for no audience in theory. You do it for yourself and um, the writing doesn't have to be any good. It doesn't matter if the punctuation is correct or incorrect. Um, and as long as I keep it that pure liberated space where I can show up as my most unedited self um, without you know, any expectation of what a journal should be or what a good journal entry might look like, um, then I've found that the form keeps, you know, opening itself up to me in new ways. Lately, I've been doodling in my journal and sketching. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because the whole unedited bit and it's just for you. How precious were you about keeping what you wrote secret? Cause like I grew up with a nosy mom. So I was always, you know, kind of concerned that she was going to go through my stuff and maybe I won't, won't write this down. <laughs> anywhere. Um, my mom actually commented on, on this very thing to me, not that long ago. She said, it's always struck me how trusting you are. Like you leave your journals around and you don't seem to worry about anybody reading them. And I thought about it. And I think, you know, part of it is that I'm a trusting person. Part of it is maybe a sense of projection. I would never be interested in reading your journal or in reading someone else's journal. So maybe I assume the same is, is true of other people. Um, but I think there are, you know, all kinds of ways to protect that space. I do have like a, an old steamer trunk where I put my old journals and I have a key. Um, mm that I use, although I confess that I've misplaced it and have no idea where it is currently. Um, mm -hmm. 
I know people who burn their journals. I know, um, you know, I, I think, yeah, it's whatever works for you, whatever allows it to feel like a sacred protected space. Right. Um, I do, you know, I did a question comes up a lot, um, which is that, you know, what, what do, a lot of people's big fear is what would happen to their journals if they were to pass away. They wouldn't want their kids to read it. They wouldn't want their significant other to read it. Um, and so one thing I have done is I've designated a dear friend and collaborator of mine as a person who will get my journals and I don't care what she does with them, but I trust her enough to trust that she'll do the right thing with them. I love that. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. So you moved around a lot. Um, and I think that was because your dad was a was teaching and he had different teaching posts. Was that the main reason why you moved around so much? Um, you know, I think the, the the reason we moved around a lot was both my parents came to the U.S. as immigrants. Um, mm -hmm. My mom was not an American citizen until a couple of years ago, um, and I think they weren't sure where they wanted to be. Um, they started. A family here they you know my brother and I were both born here but all of their family was abroad um and so I think you know for those first 10 years of our lives they were very much trying to figure out if they could make a life for themselves in the U.S. um and because they're both from very different countries and very different cultures trying to see if um you know if they weren't going to stay in the U.S. where they would best fit. Um, and what allowed them to do that was my dad's job. He was a professor. Um, mm -hmm. And so he was often applying for research fellowships or sabbaticals or things like that, that allowed him uh, and my mom to go back to their homelands um, for, for long chunks of time. Do you recall any sorts of uh, Tunisian or Swiss ideologies or philosophies or lessons that were echoed around your household to you and your brother when you guys were growing up, like simple things, you know, things your dad would say, you know, you need to work hard or what, you know, immigrant wisdom, anything mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. I mean, we definitely had a lot of that immigrant wisdom. Like if I was <laughs> able to do this, given all the privilege that you and your brother have, then you have to be able to do something even more extraordinary. I mean, there was a lot of that. Um, I think, uh, you know, a, a big thing um, in, in North Africa and the Middle East is hospitality. Um, and that was something that both my parents took very seriously. Um, we had an open door policy. Uh, neighborhood kids and family friends were always showing up for dinner. Mm -hmm. um, if someone needed a couch to sleep on or a safe haven or a place to stay, they were always welcome at our home. And what that sometimes meant was that our house looks like a youth hospital um, <laughs> or, or that at, at, on any given night, um, yeah, we'd have anywhere from two to sometimes five unexpected guests, but they, they, really, um, they really made that um, not just a part of their life, but a value that was upheld and, and one that they, they wanted to impart to us. Um, I think superstition um, and kind of magical thinking uh, is definitely uh, something I inherited from the Tunisian side of my family and um, that I think um, definitely feels connected to my creative process now. Mm. And you mentioned later in, in your teens that when you started practicing the double bass, the upright bass, that you got disciplined. So I'm just curious, what does undisciplined Suleika look like and versus disciplined Suleika in her personal life? Mm. Um, then or now? Then, then. Then. Um, I was a feral child until probably eighth grade. Um, mm -hmm. I was always running around without shoes. I was always getting in trouble. I was a terrible student. I was very rebellious um, and mischievous. 
And um, I had a kind of epiphany when I was in the ninth grade. Um, I was running around, I was at a public school in upstate New York and running around with a crowd of kids who were, um, as is often the case, I think in small towns, although of course I'm generalizing, they were cool, but they weren't necessarily going down a good road. Um, and I remember going to the movie theater with my mom and we watched um, a movie that of course I'm blanking on, on the name of, um, where Julia Roberts is a professor at an all women's prestigious college. And there was one scene in particular that struck me, which was that on the first day of class, all these young women showed up and they'd already read the whole textbook. Um, and I remember watching that movie and being so inspired by all the different young women in it and understanding that they were going somewhere and they were going somewhere because they were prepared and because they put in the work and because they were smart. And from literally the next day, I, I went back to school. I took my lunch tray, walked past my group of friends and went straight to the library and started studying. And I mm. stopped hanging out with that crowd. And I remember seeking out the two smartest kids in my class and saying, can you teach me how to study? Um, and it really was for me, um, and, and this is rarely the case in my life, but it really was a kind of instant turning point where I understood that, you know, there was value in that kind of undisciplined uh, freedom and, and wildness, uh, but that also, um, if I wanted to be the kind of person I was intent on becoming, if I wanted the kind of life that I was intent on having, that I was going to need to not just be disciplined, but to really, you know, take myself and, and the cultivation of, of my mind seriously. Wow. Was that Mona Lisa smile? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just looked it up. Because I know every parent listening to this is now going to want to show their child Mona Lisa smile so they can get their act together. <laughs> and I should say, this was in the 90s. I haven't re or early 2000s. I haven't re we don't know if it. it holds so up. I, I don't know if it holds up. I don't know if it's aged well. So I'll just add that caveat. <laughs> were you... Um... Were you gifted as a musician in, 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 in the general sense? Like the people hear you play and go, oh my God, you need to play at the highest levels? Um, or did you see a gift within yourself and just were focused on that path? I, I never thought of myself as gifted. I loved playing the upright bass. Um, and it, you know, I had a, um, a mentor who saw me perform uh, when I was about 15 years old mm -hmm. um, and sent me to New York City to play for a double bassist by the name of Homer Mensch. And Homer Mensch at the time was about 90 years old. Um, he'd been the principal bassist in the New York Philharmonic. He played the, you know, the opening of Jaws, the dun 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 um, you know, he was that this, was him playing? That, that was him. And he was this old school icon. Um, and I played for him. And um, he stopped me about 30 seconds in and said, everything about the way you play is completely wrong. <laughs> and then he gave me some direction and I played some more. And at the end of that hour, he said, all right, let's go out and talk to your mother. And he explained to the two of us, that he wanted me to start at the Juilliard pre-college school starting the following week and can make arrangements to see if there were any scholarship possibilities. And, and that really set me on a path of, of studying music more seriously. But I think up until that point, it was something I did for myself, something I found endlessly kind of fascinating. Um, and I don't know that I really thought I was anything special at it until um, until someone else really kind of took the time um, to, yeah, make me feel that maybe there was something there and to show me 
a path forward where I could hone that craft. Hmm. What did you envision yourself becoming, even as a 16 year old, when you projected ahead, maybe 10 years or, or 20 years as we do, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Hmm. I was always like a, a kind of maniacally creative kid. I danced, I did ballet and modern dance, I painted, I wrote, I played the bass. So I don't know that I knew exactly what it was that I wanted to do um, because I had all of these different interests, but I think I knew um, that I wanted to do something that would feel kind of endlessly um, inspiring and, and, and satisfying in the way that these different creative pursuits might. Um, and for about a minute, I, I tried to pursue becoming a classical double bassist um, and had a really sobering experience of hearing about um, a position opening up at one of the big orchestras for one double bassist. And then later hearing that something like 1500 double bassists from around the world had flown in. <laughs> Um, and I think, you know, by the end of that conservatory experience, I was about 18, I, you know, without devaluing myself, knew that I was never going to be good enough at the base to have the kind of career that would fulfill me. Um, mm -hmm. And so I decided to keep playing the base for myself. I was still, you know, touring with orchestras and doing that kind of thing. Um, but that I wasn't going to pursue it professionally. And so I shifted gears and, and went to college instead of conservatory. You had also been experimenting with different writing styles. Yeah. What was the motivation behind that? Um, there wasn't really a motivation. Other than that, I, I came up with a deal with my parents that I could drop out of high school uh, so that I could okay. focus on the base and, and that in exchange, I would take a couple of classes at the small liberal arts college where my dad taught and where I could take classes for free. Um, and so a couple of those classes were, um, you know, literature classes and, and had some kind of creative writing components to them. And that was the first time I'd really studied writing in a classroom setting. Um, and read, you know, seriously and rigorously. Um, and it made me want to do and to try to recreate the things that I was reading. Hmm. And you're still journaling every day. Maybe not every day, but yeah, a lot. <laughs> okay. And uh, so let's cut to spring of 2011. You're getting tired. A lot. And your parents think you have AIDS or something like this. Yeah. They think something's really wrong with you. So I graduated from college in 2010. Um, and, and that first year out of college was a really disorienting one. Um, I was having all kinds of symptoms although I wouldn't have called them that at the time. I was tired all the time. I was bruising easily. I was constantly coming down with new infections and bouts of bronchitis and things like that. Um, and I was losing a lot of weight and was very pale and no one could figure out what was wrong with me. Um, and, you know, the tests they ran every possible test they could think of other than a bone marrow biopsy, which uh, doctors felt wasn't necessary for someone of my age. And so there were all kinds of theories. At one point I was hospitalized for a week um, and, and released with a diagnosis of burnout syndrome. I was told that I needed to see a therapist. I was told all kinds of things. And so by the end of that, you know, kind of multi-month journey of, of misdiagnosis, um, there was a sense that something was seriously wrong. Um, and when the doctors did perform that bone marrow biopsy, 
and I received my actual diagnosis, which was a really aggressive form of leukemia um, in a strange way. It, it was such a relief. Um, it was a relief to know what was wrong and to hopefully be able to do something about it. It was a relief to know that I hadn't been making up these symptoms or somehow losing my mind. Um, and um, it was also one of those moments in a life where there's a sense of, of a deep fracture of a life before and a life after. And even though I didn't really know what it meant to have leukemia and I couldn't grasp, you know, how it would impact my life, I did have a sense that the person I was before uh, was buried and that I wasn't going to be able to, to go back to, to that life that I'd had. Mm. What would you say your, if you can remember your first concern when you heard that diagnosis about you or your life or someone in your life mm. as, and it can be a superficial vein, what, you know, cause I, I know it, you know, you, you have your own sort of relationship with this over time and it, and it changes, but I'm just curious mm. what your first thought was compared to what we'll talk later about what your, your later thoughts were. Yeah. So I'll share with you my, my first question that I asked and my first concern because they're different. Mm. My first question was, am I going to lose my hair? And I asked that not from a place of, of vanity, but from a place of disbelief um, because my cancer was totally invisible. I couldn't see it or feel it or touch it or smell it. And the only kind of image in my mind that I had from movies or books, uh, about what it meant to have cancer was losing your hair. Um, and so for some reason, when he said, yes, you are going to lose your hair, that's when I started to cry. Um, and not because it was about my hair, but because it suddenly felt real to me, um, and in that same moment, I think that my, that first concern bloomed, which was an awareness of how I was appearing in that moment and how it was impacting my parents, which is to say that I was concerned about them. I didn't, you know, I wanted to be brave. I wanted to be stoic for them. I knew, you know, how deeply horrifying and, and painful it must be for, for a parent to watch their child get this kind of diagnosis, to hear that your kid has, you know, a poor prognosis and a 35% chance of survival. And so I remember in that same moment of like tearing up, also wanting to kind of rearrange my face into a more stoic, optimistic facade um, and feeling so protective of them. Did you consider yourself to be an attractive person before then? And I'm asking that because sometimes we have, we're hypercritical of our, you know, this little acne on my thing. And, you know, but then you look back at your younger self, you're like, oh my God, I was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say that I considered myself to be an attractive person until my appearance drastically changed mm -hmm. when I was sick. Um, and I remember, you know, when I lost my hair, I'd lost about 50 pounds, um, walking down the street and realizing in New York city and realizing nobody was cat calling or whistling mm -hmm. and, 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 I seemed almost invisible. Um, and it made me realize that I was used to a certain kind of attention that I hadn't even recorded um, or really been aware of until it was absent. But I'll also say that in a way to be like 
scrubbed of not just your your looks but what felt like to me like my femininity or my my sexuality was also liberating um i remember being able to have certain friendships uh with men that i wouldn't have been able to have i think pre-diagnosis because i felt comfortable it was just totally off the table um and there was a sense of of you know vulnerability but also um great kind of openness um, because yeah, all the usual things that you're consumed with in your early 20s, dating and looks and body image or whatever it might be, um, just weren't even really on my mind or on anyone's mind in those hospital rooms. And you had been working as a paralegal. What were your career aspirations before the di pre-diagnosis? Mm. Um, no, so I've always loved to write. I think um, I also felt this need to pick a, a kind of practical career um, to have some sense of financial stability. Um, you know, I was very intent on or not even intent, I knew I needed to support myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the idea of, of writing professionally was really mystifying to me. Like I remember seeing internships at like different magazines or, or newspapers, but most of them were unpaid and they were in big cities and the math just didn't work. Um, uh, I was you know, really excited about the idea of going into journalism. But again, um, you know, it was one of those careers where it wasn't clear to me how to get my foot in the door. Um, so in the interim, I got this job as a paralegal. I thought, you know, if I like it, maybe I'll apply to law school. If I don't, you know, what it means is I'll be able to have a place of my own and and, and maybe buy myself a little time to figure out what my next steps are. So you never, in, in the beginning, after getting the diagnosis, you never saw that as a potential pathway to writing. The diagnosis? That was, if anything, that was, that was gonna set you back. Yeah, more. at the time of my diagnosis, I very, especially, you know, once I learned that the, the treatments were failing and that I was gonna have to do a clinical trial, Mm -hmm. The idea of being able to have any career um, during all of that seemed impossible. Um, and more than that, like I couldn't really think about the future because the future had suddenly become a very scary place because I didn't know if I was going to be able to exist in that future. Um, and, you know, my, my physical limitations were pretty significant. So while I, you know, still had that same hunger and, and sense of ambition and curiosity about different things I wanted to pursue, um, the how uh, felt, you know, impossible to answer when I was spending much of my time, you know, living out of hospital rooms. Hmm. So you mentioned that uh, Frida Kahlo became an inspiration to you and you kind of had this shift, this mental shift of not wasting any of your time. Can you talk a little bit about what that led you, what, what sort of epiphanies that, that led you to in the hospital room? Mm, yeah, so that first year of treatment, I was really angry. Um, you know, overnight I lost my job, my apartment, my independence, and I moved back into my childhood bedroom and um, I felt really stuck. Um, and I felt like, you know, at that point, I hadn't really done anything that I was proud of yet. I'd spent, you know, my 22 years on the planet preparing for a life, you know, studying, going to college, doing all these things that we do in preparation for, for whatever comes next. Um, and 
I um, really, like I said, struggled to figure out what I could do from bed. Uh, and it wasn't until I started reading about Frida Kahlo, who at a similar age had found herself bedridden because of an automobile accident. And as I learned about her learning how to paint and making these self-portraits from bed, that would end up you know, making her one of the most famous artists of all time. Um, it wasn't until her and until reading, you know, about other artists and, and writers throughout history who'd also found themselves uh, stuck in bed that I understood that to hold on to, you know, whatever plans or dreams I'd had pre-diagnosis and to apply them to my circumstances was going to be an, a recipe for endless frustration and that instead I was going to need to not only accept my limitations, but to actually um, see if there might be ways to transform those limitations into something artful or creative or maybe even useful. Um, and so, um, you know, feeling very much inspired by Frida Kahlo, but knowing I wasn't a good painter. Um, I didn't try to, you know, make self-portraits from bed, but I started writing self-portraits in a way from bed. Um, and that was very new for me. I never really written in the first person um, other than in a journal. I'd always thought of myself as the kind of person who would be a journalist who would help other people tell their stories. Was that when the 100 day project began? Or was that, that was a result a, of the 100 day project? It was a result of the 100 day project. Um, the 100 day project uh, was something I did with my friends and family uh, where we each picked one creative thing every day that we were gonna do for 100 days. So my mom painted a ceramic tile every day for 100 days that she assembled into a shield and hung above my bed, it's still above my bed. Um, and that she told me had protective powers my dad wrote a hundred childhood memories about growing up in Tunisia. And for mine, I went back to journaling because I'd stopped journaling. Um, but that journaling, I think was directly related to what came next because in journaling every day for a hundred days, I found that my writing was very different. And, and though I couldn't be a foreign correspondent in the way I'd hoped I was in essence reporting from the front lines of my hospital bed on that mm -hmm. experience of illness. I was, you know, recording snippets of dialogue between the nurses. I was writing observations about my body and all the ways it was changing. I was, you know, reflecting on, on new found friendships with fellow patients in the ward. Um, I was writing about navigating our insane healthcare system. <laughs> Uh, and I was especially, you know, really trying to kind of excavate the subjects that felt too hot to touch, too tender, um, that felt somehow taboo or, or maybe would be upsetting to other people. So I was writing about what it's like to be young and to be confronting your mortality or what it's like to go through infertility, um, which I did because of the chemo or what it's like to be in a new romantic relationship, to be falling in love while you're falling sick. I wrote about all of it. This was the hundred day. This is not your blog that you started after that, right? I know you wrote about a lot of personal things in the blog, but in the hundred days, that's what those the, the things you're describing. Yeah, yeah. So that was just you know, that was just in my journal, um, and but that journal became the source material, right? Um, for the blog that I started, and then later for the New York Times column. So, question before we get into the blog, did you have any sort of? You mentioned magical thinking earlier. Um, did you have any sort of spiritual practices? Were you cutting deals with God? God, if you can get me out of this, I will never drink another <laughs> drop of alcohol. Uh, anything like that going on in your mind, manifestation, visualization, prayer, anything like that that you were experiencing? Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I was raised in a very spiritual home, I would say, but my dad uh, was raised Muslim. My mom was raised Catholic. And, and because of that, I think for my brother and me, we kind of lived in this space of ambiguity. So we, you know, very much practiced the traditions that went along with both of our, you know, our parents' faiths. Um, but I also think that this sort of short and simple way to say it is that we were confused. Um, <laughs> and, you know, when I got sick, oddly enough, um, I went the opposite direction. Uh, I was not interested in having a spiritual practice whatsoever. And part mm -hmm. of that was because every single time I would, got really sick, like it seemed like, you know, it could go either way. A, a chaplain would show up at my hospital room door. And every time a chaplain showed up at my hospital room door, I would get really scared. <laughs> he was like the Grim remember, Reaper. Yeah, basically a spiritual Grim Reaper. And I remember like one day turning to my mom and saying, am I allowed to swear? Yeah. I won't swear. I, I, I remember being like, crap, like this must mean I'm really not doing well. Um, so, yeah, so I think because of that and because um, when, when you're sick, especially with something like cancer, there's so much pressure in a way to become a kind of like beatific saint-like patient. Um, I really kind of bucked against that pressure. Um, but that changed when I had my bone marrow transplant. A bone marrow transplant's a really risky procedure. I was... Uh, very scared going into it. And my first night in the transplant unit, I remember, you know, I was so weak, like getting out of bed and dragging my IV pole and all the tubes over and getting on the floor and, and praying, although it was more like a kind of haggling bargain with a higher power and exactly what you're describing. Like, if you let me live, I will be this, I will do this better. I will, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but really underneath all of that haggling was one simple plea, uh, which was that I wanted to live. Hmm. And so after that, um, I did have, um, you know, I did start a kind of prayer practice, although that maybe makes it sound more formal than it actually was. Hmm. Um, so what 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 was the catalyst for starting the blog on the day that you started that blog? Like why that day as opposed to any other day? So I started a blog that I was like a really kind of bootstrappy blog that I made um, that was, you know, a couple I, I think it was a, a month or two before my bone marrow transplant. Mm -hmm. And and the reason I started that blog was because I knew that my odds of surviving the transplant weren't very good. And I realized that I wanted to do the thing that I'd set out to do uh, when I graduated from college, which was to try to pursue writing. And it didn't really matter to me if anybody read it. It didn't matter what would come of it because I didn't really know or, or think necessarily that I was going to be around for very long. And so I just started this blog and I took it really seriously and, and, and tried to hold myself to the highest bar I could. Um, and very quickly after starting that blog, it began to circulate and an editor from the New York Times um, invited me to write something for the paper. So in this kind of surreal twist, I went from being a kind of aspiring writer who'd never been published before to being offered a weekly column and video series in the New York Times. And the launch date for that um, which was not by design, it was a coincidence, uh, coincided with my first week in the bone marrow transplant unit. Um, and I write in the book and, and it still feels true 
um, which is that it felt like a, a dream and a nightmare dancing the tango. So this, you know, very exciting opportunity to write um, and, and this really, which felt like a kind of beginning and this very terrifying, you know, reality of, of having to go through a transplant, um, which felt potentially like a kind of ending. And you mentioned the blog gave you purpose. Uh, presumably sitting in the hospital room, feeling like your life didn't have a purpose. And, and now you're writing. You didn't care how many people were reading it. You just wanted to write. And so all of those wonderful things happened. But would you say that the call from the New York Times editor was, was the highlight of that experience or did you feel that having that sense of purpose was the real highlight and then the call from New York at New York Times editor was really a symptom of that feeling that sense of purpose yeah um I mean it, don't get me wrong it was really exciting and, and validating <laughs> I felt like doing cartwheels in my hospital gown um but you turned them down too you said <laughs> yeah that's true I did at first um yeah, I, you know, I think one of the strange, beautiful byproducts of being very sick or very close to death is that all of the artifice falls away. Like, whatever you might put on your resume, whatever, you know, awards, whatever accolade, like none of that really matters anymore. Um, and so for me, in this strange way, um, being so sick uh, reshuffled my priorities and really kind of stripped everything down to what felt most meaningful to me. And it was very simple. It was spending time with my loved ones. And it was... Um, doing work that felt purposeful um, and, and, um, and feeling also within that work a sense of service because that was very important to me. Um, you know, it was important to me to feel like if I was going to fall on the wrong side of those odds, I would, you know, I didn't want to, um, I wanted to be able to leave more than I'd taken from the world. And so really, yeah, that sense of purpose and that sense of, of love uh, for my family and, and for my closest friends uh, were the, the two things that felt important to me. What do you feel it was about your blog? I mean, there've been so many, like you said, movies about cancer, stories and books and what was it about your blog that you think appealed to a platform like the New York Times? Um, I can't, you know, speak for them. I can speak to what my thinking was in terms of what I hope to offer with that column. Um, I'd read at that point a lot of cancer books. I'd read, mm -hmm. you know, I'd watch TV shows, I'd watch movies. And, and my big frustration um, was that a lot of those stories were told from the perspective of someone who had survived and who was many years out of that experience and who had mm -hmm. kind of lived to tell the tale. Mm -hmm. um, or they were written, you know, by parents or caregivers of a sick person who had died. Um, and I couldn't really relate to either of those perspectives. Um, and they both felt kind of uh, unnerving in different ways. Um, and so what I really was seeking and ended up trying to create when I couldn't find it was someone who was really writing from the trenches of the uncertainty of not knowing which way things are going to go or how your story is going to end. Um, 
And so that's what I, that was the first thing I set out to do was to write it almost in real time. Um, and the second thing I, I, I really wanted to do in part because I was frustrated by certain depictions of cancer was to upend the narrative of a sick person or a cancer patient as some kind of, you know, heroic figure. Um, hmm. We talk about the hero's journey, but I think that that hero's journey arc is is often projected onto people who have been through or survived a traumatic experience. You know, you're expected to be grateful and brave and wiser for what you've been through. And I think in doing that, we end up, you know, silencing um, a lot of the harder, uglier, more complicated parts of that experience. And so I wanted to write about the topics that felt taboo. I wanted to write about anger. I wanted to write about guilt. I wanted to write about, you know, all those things I've been exploring in the privacy of a journal, um, but to do that in a public stage. And, and leading up to all of the notoriety you started getting from your column, were there people saying to you that, hey, you're working too hard, you got to rest more, you know, um, this blog thing, you, you know, it'll wait, it, it, it'll, you know, you just, you got to take care of it, you got to heal first. Was there anyone saying that kind of thing to you? Yes. I mean, the funny thing is that people had been saying that to me since I was a teenager, and they still say it to me today. But I think illness has a way of heightening everything. So for mm -hmm. me, it heightened that need to make sense of this experience and to try to kind of alchemize it into some kind of form or some kind of creative grist. Um, yeah, people told me that all the time. My doctors, my mom, my dad, my boyfriend at the time, my friends. Um, and they were probably right. Um, but also I think, you know, that was my way of, of moving through this experience, um, like s survival in its most productive form felt like a kind of creative act. Um, and the alternative, which I'd done for a year, uh, was not something I wanted. I didn't want to be a kind of passive agent in this experience of illness. I wanted to engage with it as a subject matter. Um, well, you also mentioned that a lot of the letters that you started receiving as a result of your writing, they, they kept you hopeful and, and they were kind of like your friends almost, even though these people didn't really know you personally. And people began doing things for you that didn't know you as much or more so than people who did know you? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you go through, people often say that you find out who your real friends are when you go through something difficult. And, and that was true for me. Like some of the friends I expected to be there for me when I got sick, didn't show up and, and some did. But I think what was um, incredibly surprising to me were the number of, of people, you know, perfect strangers who came out of the woodwork, um, you know, neighbors of my parents who they never met, who were dropping off casseroles, uh, you know, childhood friends that I'd lost touch with um, who, who were reaching out. Um, but what really shocked me were the number of letters I received in response to the column. I'd hoped, you know, that the column would be resonant with other, you know, young people living with cancer. But what I didn't expect is that people would read into the title of the column, which was Life Interrupted, and see their own experiences kind of mirrored back within that. And so I started getting letters from people who'd been through all kinds of interruptions, who'd been through 
you know, divorces or, or major heartbreaks or people who'd lost their jobs or who'd been victims of sexual assault it didn't really matter what it was. But I think um, to have that sense of connection, especially at a time when I was so isolated, I was in medical isolation. Um, I couldn't go out in public and um, I was stuck in a room, felt like a kind of conduit to the outside. It felt um, good uh, to, to shift my perspective away from my own circumstances uh, to the stories of others. And the little GQ, uh, Quentin Jones, the inmate in Texas, was he a reader of the New York Times? Like, how did he come across your column? And I know when you're in prison, you can't send an email. So how, how did he reach out to you? Did he actually write you a letter? How did he know where to send it to? How did it, how did it reach you? Yeah. So I wrote a column called My Incanceration, where I reflected on some of the parallels in terms of the language that's used around medical diagnosis and, and sentencing and, and that experience of, of being stuck in medical isolation and essentially of like awaiting a verdict, um, which is what it can feel like when you're, you're waiting for you know, someone to read the results of a biopsy and a pen pal of Quentin Jones uh, clipped that column out of the paper and mailed it to him. And he wrote them back and with a letter for me and asked them to relay it to me. And so that's how we began corresponding. Um, and he, his letter was one of the first letters that I received uh, from someone who wasn't, you know, tied to me by blood or uh, obligation or in my friend group. Um, and I remember, you know, feeling such a sense of vertigo when I read that letter. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I was in the hospital and I remember looking at this like perfect cursive on this, you know, blue line note book paper and thinking about how far it had traveled and thinking about the person holding the pen who'd written those words, who was in a very different kind of isolation and confinement on death row in Texas. Was he a prolific writer or was that an unusual thing for him to reach out to you? He was a prolific pen pal friend. And in that sense, he was a prolific writer. Um, and, you know, he would write what he called mini books, which were like 13 to 20 page letters. Um, and, and that was really the thing that gave him a sense of purpose mm. um, in his, you know, most difficult passage. It was the thing that allowed him to feel connected. But more than that, it was his way of trying to put as much goodness into the world um, and, and to kind of um, not make up for what he'd done because he would be the first person to tell you that that wasn't possible, but to kind of counterbalance um, the, you know, the anger and, and the violence and, and the hurt of his youth with the person he was trying to become. Hmm. And uh, when you healed, you mentioned that which I thought was really interesting. You missed the hospital system mm -hmm. because people were broken and you missed the clarity that your sickness gave you. And, but yet at the same time, you're now recognized as this sort of motivational presence through your column, you're getting speaking engagements. And so you're very much becoming the person who you, who you, who you are, how did, how did you sort of balance those two things? The thing that, that you always wanted, which was to heal was mm -hmm. really the thing that was giving you clarity. And yet you were known as this person who was kind of in the trenches, <laughs> but now you're not really in the trenches at a certain point. So yeah, that's um, a big graduation. It was a big graduation. And, and I think, you know, part of the challenge was that I thought being cured meant being healed. 
Mm. And I very quickly understood that there's a big difference between those two things. Um, and so, you know, I was so focused on reaching that, that place of being cured that I don't think I really thought about what happened after. I thought I would just like quickly and eagerly like jump back into living, uh, but that didn't happen. There was this like long in-between place as I called it, where, you know, on paper I was cured, I was better, but off paper, I was struggling. I was carrying, you know, the weight of, of four years of treatment and the wreckage of all of that in my body. I had, you know, all kinds of side effects um, from my treatment that I was trying to figure out how to, you know, accept and, and, and work with. Um, I was carrying the sort of spiritual and emotional trauma of that experience. And I was grieving. I, you know, had befriended a group of young cancer patients and we really became like family. And out of, you know, 10 of those people, only three of us were alive at that point. Um, and, you know, I think that that experience uh, of missing the hospital is something we hear from veterans sometimes coming back from war like you learn to live in whatever reality you're in and that's what i did when i was sick you know i learned to speak fluent medical ease i got to know my nurses and doctors i got to love them i got you know i befriended fellow patients i i understood that world i got used to navigating it um but suddenly it was the outside world that felt really scary and disorienting and I found it hard to connect with people who hadn't lived what I'd lived through or some version of that. Um, and so basically what I realized was that I wasn't going to be able, I, you know, it wasn't possible for me to move on from illness, but I was going to have to figure out how to move forward with it. And I was going to figure out, need to figure out how to heal, uh, mm. which was a process. Um, and as for, you know, the public um, persona piece of it, um, you know, I think this is the great burden of living your life out loud. Um, however it is that you do that, which is that at some point, who you are to the outside world isn't going to sync up with who you are in private. Um, and, and for me, when I reached that point where, you know, from the outside, it seemed like I was doing really well. Um, and from the inside, I was as lost as I possibly could have been. Um, I knew that for me, that meant that I needed to shut down the public part of my life until I could have, until I could feel integrated again. And so I stopped writing, um, I stopped, you know, doing as many speaking engagements. I stopped doing all the things I've been doing. And I decided to carve out some time for myself to be alone and to reflect and um, to seek out some of the people who I felt might offer, be able to offer guidance like little GQ, Quentin Jones, and like some of those other strangers uh, who'd written me letters and who understood what it meant to be in a place of reckoning and, and to really have to figure out how to move forward when your life has been upended. And so that's what I did. I ended up going on a 15,000 mile road trip um, and seeing those people and, and taking that time before I was ready um, to figure out what I wanted to do next in private or, or in public for that matter. And this is another one of those experiences where you, you make the announcement, okay, I'm going to go, <laughs> I'm going to teach myself how to drive. Then I'm going to go 15,000 miles to 33 States and visit people who I've met online. I mean, people, your friends, your family, they come out of the woodwork. Oh my God, you know, you're going too far. Um, maybe you want to think about this a little bit more. Did you have that same resistance? Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I didn't. Um, right. I'm sure I did, but I didn't from the people 
whose opinion would have made me pause, which was my parents. Um, and I remember my mom saying, first of all, we know that whatever we're going to say is not going to change your mind. So <laughs> <laughs> if anything, but, it'll make you want to do it even more. Probably. Exactly. <laughs> but second of all, she said, I have spent the last you know, couple of years feeling so afraid for you, for our family, so worried, so many sleepless nights. And, and the idea of you going on a solo road trip fills me with worries, but they're normal parent worries. And what a privilege it is to have normal parent worries. This is the kind of thing you should do. This is the kind of worry you should make your parents feel. Um, and, and she really understood that and, and understood why I needed to do it and, and supported mm. it um, and, and gave me her blessing. Um, and I was so moved by that. Um, and, you know, I also, we had lots of conversations about safety when you're traveling alone and I would check in with them every time I was at a campground or whatever, you know, so I wasn't totally uh, throwing caution to the wind and like embarking on a, on a reckless boondoggle. Um, but yeah, to have my, my parents' blessing and more than that, their, their belief that I would, you know, make it through that, that difficult passage of, of, of no longer and not yet um, made me believe that I could. You, you also mentioned um, that you got an opportunity to uh, look through your mother's journal. Presumably she gave you permission to do so. Yeah, yeah. And you got to see what she wrote about being a caregiver. And what did you discover from her mm -hmm. entries? You know, when I returned from that road trip and, and started writing the book, um, and, and decided that it would be a memoir, it felt very important to me, not just to try to kind of render my experience of being sick as honestly and as accurately as I could, but to also really show the kind of ripple effect of something like a diagnosis on an entire family or a community. Um, and I wanted in particular to, um, you know, understand that role of, of caretaker better, to understand, you know, what it feels like for, for a parent to be in this position. And so my mom came up with the idea of, of sharing her journals with me. Um, and I think, you know, uh, and this is not an uncommon experience, I'm sure for a lot of kids, um, I think what struck me was um, witnessing her vulnerability in a way that I never had. Um, my mom has always been such a warrior for our family um, and so, you know, fiercely strong and, and protective of, of all of us um, that to read her fear to see her sadness, to bear witness to, you know, her, her fragility in this way um, that she wrote about in her journal was, was really humbling for me. Um, and she never really let me see that side of her. And of course I, you know, on some level I knew it was there. Um, but I think like a lot of kids, I was still seeing my parents as my parents and not as full humans mm -hmm. with all these different facets and contradictions mm -hmm. and strengths and, and, you know, points of real tenderness. Mm. There are two places that kind of freaked me out or <laughs> used to freak me out uh, going to visit people. One was in hospitals mm. And the other one was in jail and I've been to both. Mm. And I'm curious when you went to go see little GQ on death row, 
What was that experience like going into the prison for the first time? Um, Having spent it, so much time in the hospital yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's not surprising to me that, that both those places would freak you out. Um, and without, you know, overdrawing the parallels because they're very different experiences, of course, um, you know, there are certain similarities. They're both places of, of, of major reckoning, of, of major loss, not just for the people who are on the inside, but for the people on the outside who are going to visit. Um, they can be places that feel, you know, full of despair. They can also be places where you know, of, of great reinvention. Um, and, you know, when I went to see little GQ, I felt nervous. I felt more nervous about the protocol and mm -hmm. like not quite being sure of what I was allowed to bring with me and what I was allowed to do and this and that and the other. Um, but the second uh, GQ appeared on the other side of the plexiglass and we started talking um, I think we both immediately kind of settled in um, because we had a shared language. You know, he talked about survivor's guilt in the context of the other guys on death row who'd been executed before him, even though they'd had, they'd been there for a lesser time. And I talked about survivor's guilt in the context of illness. We talked about, you know, all, all kinds of things. Um, and since then, I've done a lot of reporting in prisons and I've been mm -hmm. to different, you know, correctional settings. Um, and, and they feel the same way to me as hospitals do, or rather, you know, some of the people you encounter in, in prisons or in hospitals feel similar and that, yeah, it's, it's a, individuals who have been kind of stripped down to their most, you know, laid bare self. Mm. Um, and why he, do you he, think you're freaked out by? Sorry. <laughs> no, gonna... Well, you know, when I was listening to that, I, I also remember that there's a lot of vulnerability on the other side. If you're in the hospital, if you're in prison, a lot. The person I was seeing in prison didn't really want people, you know seeing him in prison. He didn't want people seeing him like that. And I think a lot of people in hospitals may yeah. feel like that too. So there's a lot of, of, of reconciling on both ends. You know, how do I show up for this person so that I'm not making it all about me, but then how do I, mm -hmm. how do I empathize with that situation? And they're thinking probably the same thing. I don't know, yeah. but it's, I think it's a really beautiful moment to, to be honest, to, to, to indulge in honesty. On, on both ends. Well, and, and for both people, regardless of which side of the plexiglass you're on or whether mm -hmm. you're in the hospital bed or in the chair next to the hospital bed to kind of meet vulnerability with vulnerability. Mm. Yeah, and you, you referenced uh, Brian Stevenson's book, which I'm a huge fan of and his mm -hmm. work and, and working on death row and everything. And just some of the his thoughts around everyone is broken and and I thought that was very poignant but little GQ asked you something and you mentioned it at the very end of your book which I thought was just the perfect way to to wrap it all up um he he asked you if you could take it all back all the things you've been through the leukemia the, you know the hospital the isolation all of it would you take it back mm. It's interesting because I asked him that same question not too long ago um, when he was, you know, counting down the days to his execution date. Um, my, you know, my answer to Quinn in the moment was, I don't know. <laughs> that sounds very overwhelming for me to think about. And, and I thought about it and I kept thinking about it. And, you know, of course, if I could there was anything I could do to spare my loved ones of that suffering, that stress, then I would take it back, right? But abstracted, I think, from 
you know, any impact on the people around me, um, the answer I arrived to was, I wouldn't take it all back. I wouldn't, you know, take back what I suffered to gain this. And, and the way I arrived at that answer was by almost kind of time traveling and, and mm-hmm. thinking of, you know, all those words for, and all those letters received, um, all those new f- friendships made, all those road guardians, which is what I called, you know, Quinn and the other people I, I met on that road trip. Um, and I think, um, you know, these kinds of experiences don't necessarily make you a better person. You know, they heighten everything in you, the good and the bad. Um, But within them, there's also an opportunity if you're willing to go through that reckoning, if you're willing to, you know, be in that state of of a laid bare self um, to learn a lot about who you are and what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you want to interact with the world and the people in it. Um, And I'm glad I learned all those things. I'm glad I had that reckoning Um, because I don't think I would have the life I have now. And I don't think it would be as rich and in, in friendships and and stories and experiences without it. Hmm. I have this belief that we have the ability to to talk to our younger self, and hmm. that when we're in our day to day existence, the voice that we hear, the voice of inner guidance, is potentially our the aspect of ourself that's already lived through this experience that's now gifting us with wisdom Mm. about how best to navigate this experience. Assuming that that is the case, and you could go back and advise yourself going into the hospital after you getting the diagnosis and the prognosis, what practical wisdom would you offer to your your younger self your 22 year old self Mm. um i think that practical advice would be um essentially what what someone said to me when I was on this road trip, uh, which was that whenever you travel, you actually take three trips. Mm -hmm. There's the trip you take before you even leave home and and embark on that adventure. It's the trip of planning and packing and daydreaming and anticipation. And then there's the trip you're actually on and then there's the trip you remember, but the key is to stay in whatever trip you're on. And so I think that's the advice pretty much that I would give to myself at, at any age, but certainly at that age where I was you know, watching my peers starting careers and traveling the world and dating and all the other big and small milestones of early adulthood. And meanwhile, I felt you know, I'd gotten this diagnosis and I was profoundly stuck. And I, I felt, you know, um, like I should be doing these things. I should be filling my days in these different ways. Um, and what I missed in that kind of thinking was really uh, confronting the facts of my situation and, and, and the the gifts that were right there, uh, which was that this was a rare time where I would be living in my childhood bedroom and I would get to be with my family. It was a rare time where I didn't have to work because I couldn't work and that maybe I could experiment or try new things. Um, but I missed all of that for the you know first year and that was okay because that's what I needed to go through. But yeah. 
Have you, just a couple more questions. Have you felt like you've been on your path these last few years? Or is it still like, I don't know, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> uh, I'm good at writing books and expressing myself, but it's, I don't know if this is quite it. Or maybe it is. Um, I think, I guess I'm not sure. I, I believe anyone isn't ever on their path. <laughs> um, so, so the short answer is yes, I feel like I'm on my path. There are also so many things I want to try and do, so many things I'm curious about, so many parts of myself that I know I need to examine and, and interrogate and understand better. Um, and I, I intend to do those things. I'm excited to do those things, um, but they all feel part of the path. I love Not it. to get too woo-woo. <laughs> well, what is someone... Uh, what do you say to someone who doesn't feel like that, that doesn't feel like they're on their path? Yeah. So the moments in my life where I felt like I'm not on my path is when I'm not acting in integrity with, you know, values or, or things that I believe to be true about who I want to be or hmm. how I want to be. Um, and so it's less about, you know, what job I may have or what relationship I'm in. Um, but it's more about, you know, why I was in the thing in the first place or, or why I'm still in it. And, and yeah, it's, it's, I think for me, it's when I feel like I'm, when I felt like I wasn't on my path, it was more a, a question of, of how to get back into integrity with myself mm. than it was about whatever particulars of my life were at play. I think that may be the answer or part of the answer to my last question, which is how do you define success these days? And obviously I'm not talking about material success, but mm. just how do you know you're, you're, you had like say in 30 years from now, you look back, how would you know that you were successful at being so like a Jawad? Mm. I mean, I think success is a lot about feeling in integrity with myself and with the things that I value. Um, or another way to say it is it's a kind of balance and yeah, that, that looks different on different days. Um, but I also think that the, the kind of newer idea of success for me is, is less tied to hustling um, mm -hmm. because I've been doing that for a long time and it's more tied to feeling a sense of ease in my life. Um, and what I mean by that is not, you know, like going on vacations all the time necessarily, but feeling a sense of ease in how I do my work or how I navigate my personal life um, and feeling like I'm breathing and like I'm, I'm present and I'm not, you know, constantly running or seeking. Mm. Love that. So, okay, I wanna wrap this up by just going back and looping around and talking about childhood again and yes. <laughs> your favorite activity uh, swimming, which what stuck out to me about that, especially related to what you just said, is this balance between exertion and support and going and flowing. Mm. And, and it seems like your life has really been a, a combination of those, which essentially you've been exerting, exerting, exerting. And then, you know, you got in this situation that sort of forced you to be more present to what is. And, and within that, you found your path, you found, you identified that, hey, I've never not been on my path. Mm -hmm. And and now you've kind of arrived at this point where you don't wanna exert all the time anymore. That's not what success is about. And, and it's really about just allowing yourself to just be and, and enjoying that support. Like you don't have to do anything in order for the water to support you really just mm. it's, it's the less you do 
the more you just allow yourself to just be and breathe and then you get everything that you were looking for. So. Beautiful. Thank you for connecting those dots. <laughs> I, I had not thought of that. And it's so well said and something I'm going to be chewing on for the rest of the day. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. I just want to acknowledge you for, um, for being present to this conversation. I know a lot of times when you, you know, you have a New York times bestseller, you've done a thousand interviews, you've told these stories a million times and yet the way you showed up here was just so present and, and um, patient. And so I, I just want to acknowledge you for that and appreciate you for that because that in and of itself is a reflection of what you've been through and, and who the person that you have sort of become on the other end of that. And, uh, and it's really beautiful. It's a really beautiful thing. And just want to acknowledge you for the gifts that you are leaving behind uh, through your books, through your, your Ted talk and your other work and your writing, and your life interrupted, the stuff that's still out there, YouTube videos, people can still watch this stuff, seeing you with a bald head going around and talking about your journey from the conflict zone, as you say. So yeah, just want to appreciate you for all of that. And I, I look forward to hopefully getting to meet in person one of these days. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thanks the for making appreciation the time. And, and gratitude is mutual. I have many questions for you. I was biting my <laughs> tongue because I know this is your interview. But yeah, I'll ask them at some point uh, when we cross paths in person. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.